Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. Sorry about yesterday's uh, audio issues. Um, we're, we're holding here in the Gemara, Mesech the Megillah, Daf Yud Aleph, Amen Aleph, 11a. And we are in the middle of discussing the different introductions and perspectives from 18 or 19 different sages as introduced Mesechta Megillah. So we're holding over here in the introduction of Reb el -Lazar. If I remember correctly, let me just pull it up on the screen. No, Rav Dimi Bar Yitzchak, the very end of ten, uh, the very end of ten B, second to last line. Rav Dimi, Rav Dimi Bar Yitzchak, Pasach la Pitzcha la Hay Parshasa Mehacha. When Rav Dimi Bar Yitzchak introduced his explanations to his students on Megillas Esther, he began his introduction from here. It says in. Ezra, this is, I brought it up on the screen. This is right over here. It says when Ezra returned from the exiles and he came back to Eretz Yisrael, he brought with him many Jews and many Jews did not want to come, unfortunately, back to Israel because they had a comfortable life where they were in Bavel or Tunisia or different countries where they were. And in addition to that, Ezra is describing what happened when he came back. And he says, um, I follow the laws of the Persian king. And however, many Jewish people, when they were in foreign countries, they married a foreign woman, non-Jewish woman. And this was a great destruction, a devastation for the Jewish people, and Ezra especially. And Ezra came. And he davened and he prayed to Hashem and he describes what he did. And you see in verse 3, they have taken the daughters for themselves of the sons. We're talking about of the nations in verse 2. The Kenanim, the Chiti, the Prizi, the Yefusi, etc. Amon, Moyav, Mitzrayim. So, you know, our biggest enemies, unfortunately. And so Ezra says, when I heard this in verse 4, Karati is big dimi'ili. I tore my garments, I tore my robes. Of Emritomisarishi, and out of grief, I tore the hairs of my head. It was cunning, and I was pulling up my hairs on my beard. But Eishwa Mishoimim, and he himself did not know what to do. And he's crying. Um, and the Charedim, those who cared about the words of Hashem, joined me in the courtyard of the base of Mikdash. And he's crying, and he's um, sitting bewildered, not knowing what to do until evening. It came time for the evening offering. He stood up from his fast, from tearing his garments. He bowed down on his knees. And he dove into Hashem, his God. And here is a prayer in verse 7, verse 8, the prayer of Ezra to Hashem. And eventually what happened is at the end, as he's praying to Hashem, this, um, this long prayer, uh, which goes for the rest of the chapter, all the Jews who married a foreign woman, they slowly but surely, one by one, joined him in the courtyard of the Beis Mikdash, and they saw his tshuva, and they themselves were awakened to do tshuva. And you see a, a tzaddik doing tshuva in front of you who cannot do tshuva as well. And... They all divorced the foreign woman, etc. It says over here in verse 9, while Ezra is praying to Hashem, the Atakimatrega, and now for a short moment, meaning currently, Hashem has been granted us favor for a short time. Meaning currently, we were just uh, 70 years ago, the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. Now finally, Hashem granted us favor. 
at the present time and allowed us to return to Eretz Yisrael. And in Hashem's holy place, and in, in the place of the Harabayas, the Beis Mikdash, the Temple Mount, Hashem has allowed us to give us uh, to 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 um, plant a peg in the ground. To uh, let us. Um, to enlighten our eyes, and in our servitude, because we're still servants to the king of Persia, Hashem has granted us a little bit of life, because we are still slaves, and while we are still slaves, we are still subjects of the Persian king, Hashem has not ever uh, left us, Hashem still grants us favor, Hashem has extended kindness to us from the kings of Persia. To give us a sustenance. In addition to that, this is a very, uh, in, in every uh, fundraising campaign for a new show, you'll see them say, we will exalt the house of Hashem to make a beautiful house for Hashem. To erect the ruins, and Hashem gave us a fence in Yehuda and Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. And then he continues about how, with all this favor that Hashem granted to us, we still have forsaken the mitzvahs of Hashem. Think about nowadays, we're already 70 years since Hashem has given us miraculously, with great miracles, the land of Eretz Yisrael. You know, behooves us only to not forsake Hashem and, and to follow after Hashem. So he explains over here. He says, Hashem has extended mercy to us from the king of Persia, a Masai. So when did this occur? This was during the times of Haman, where Hashem... Uh, where Hashem granted favor to the Jews from the kings of Persia to abolish the decrees of Haman. Maral of Prague has a, a many, many swarm on my shelf in my office. I have the whole set of Maral, and you can get lost uh, sometimes in the Maral of Prague in the swarm. So in the Sefer Archadash, which he writes about Purim, so he explains on this Gemara over here that. Even in, when the Jews are in the worst times of persecution, Hashem never removes his kindness from the Jews. And what happened during the time of Haman, Hashem did not remove his kindness from his Jews. However, this um, thing that Hashem will make the Jews thrive in exile, that was something unique specifically for that time. So two things. Over here in the Gemara says, Avidaseinu Hashem did not forsake us while we were slaves. That is in every exile. However, that Hashem should be kind to us, give us favor. That was something unique for the Malche, uh, for the Gullus, for the exile of Persia. The other exiles, we were not, Zeichu, were not merited to this, only for very short times during different exiles. But in general, throughout the Gullus and Mitzrayim, and uh, of course, the last. Uh, 1900 and uh, 40 years of exile or 1950 years of exile um, the vast majority of the time until very recently we were unfortunately also we did not really have um, times of Thriving in exile, only now at the very end of this exile, Baruch Hashem, many Jews are happy and thriving, but that's only because we're at the end of Golas and coming close to the Geula. Rashi adds a few words in this, into this Gemara over here. After the words, he adds on the next words of the verse, to give us sustenance. And the Marsha says, because giving us sustenance is part of the miracle of Purim. Because miracle of Purim was how we were changed, how we went over from death to life. Instead of 
being killed, now we're granted life. So this is something unique to Purim because other exiles, not necessarily was there always or constantly a decree of destruction of the Jews, now specifically by the time of Mordechai. Next introduction. Dafi Aleph, Amen Aleph, 11a. Reb Hanina Bar Papa. Pasacha Pischalai Pasha Samehacha. When Rabbi Hanina, the son of Papa, we're going to mention him. We mentioned him last time at the end of the Masechta. One of the sons of Rav Papa. He had 10 sons. And he, they would always learn together. And whenever they made a siyum, a, uh, a, they finished learning a certain Masechta, a tractate of Gemara. So they would make a large siyum with all 10 sons. Each one of the sons would say something and explain something. And there was a very big Kiddush Hashem. We mentioned Nebuchadnezzar Bar Papa. We'll mention him at the end of Masechta Megillah as well. So when he taught the Megillah, he this is the introduction that he gave. He gave a passage from Tehillim. Where it says, Hirkafta enosh lirashenu, banu ve'eshu v'mayim, v'tetzienu lirvaya. This is a verse in Tehillim describing or, or praising Hashem what Hashem will do when he, at the end of Galus, at the end of exile, when Mashiach comes, Hashem will do kibbutz Galus, gathering in of the exiles. From all over the world, Hashem will gather every single Jew, bring him to Eretz Yisrael. Now one Jew will be left behind. I mean, the Rebbe says already, we have a beginning, I mean, similar to that, what happened when all the Russian Jews came to Eretz Yisrael, but when Mashiach comes, we're going to have kibbutz Goliath. All the Jews will be gathered together in Eretz Yisrael. And we say over there, I kafta enosh lirashenu. Hashem, you caused a man to ride at our head. Meaning, you caused two explanations over here. It could mean either that you're going to cause Mashiach to be at our head to gather in the exiles, or it can mean as well, you cause, um, we were, we had uh, at our head, we were under the subjugation of different nations of the world. Banu v'eishu we came in fire and water, and, and, uh, and uh, we were unfortunately, you know, persecuted with fire, persecuted with water, every type of persecution that could be imagined came upon us during exile. And when you took us out was Lerevaya. Lerevaya is, we say in Mizmar Ladavid, Hoisi Revaya. My cup overfloweth. My cup overflows from goodness. So he explains, quoted this verse in Tehillim, you have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water for your sake. By Tetzienu Lerevaya, be brought us out into overflowing abundance. What does that mean? When did this occur? When we went through fire and through water. That when was Be'esh? When did we go through fire? Bimei Nebuchadnezzar. Harasha. During the times of the evil king, evil king Nebuchadnezzar. During the times of Nebuchadnezzar, famously, three um, Mishal, Hananiah, Nazaria. We mentioned them previously in the beginning of this Masechta. They're going to be mentioned again. Uh, three great princes from the family of Yehuda were taken as little children, abducted, abducted by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, we learned what he did to them. We mentioned it earlier. Or Mr. Minsky mentioned to me about that as well. And what happened is, is that they refused to bow down to the image, the idol that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. And they were thrown into a fiery furnace. It says it was on the day of Yom Kippur. And what happened is, is that day a miracle happened and they were not burnt. They did not die. And they survived miraculously. The only thing that was burnt was the uh, bonds burning them. And I think the edge of their hair also was burnt. If you, um, if, you, if you read the Gemara over there. So when did we go through fire? 
We're talking about the days of Hananya, Mishal, and Azariah during the days of the evil Nebuchadnezzar, when he said that all the boys, that, no, that um, when he threw them into the fiery furnace. When is the next part of the Pasuk? Uvamayim. When did we go through water on a, a colossal scale? That was Bimei Paray. During the days of Paray, where Paray decreed every single Jewish boy that is born should be thrown into the Nile River. And the end of the verse, when did Hashem take us out in order to be uh, having overflowing abundance? That was Bimei Haman, during the times of Haman, where Haman wanted to destroy the Jews, but in the end, Hashem saved them. And as a result, a very um, we, we have a takana, we have the holiday of Purim, where we all have overflowing feasts, great joy. So with a lot of simcha, a lot of joy. So this happened during the time of Haman, when Hashem saved the Jews from Haman's um, decree, Haman's plan. Marsha adds on over here. If you look in Tehillim, we say this every Friday night, um, it says, Koisi Revaya, my cup overflows. So Revaya is also Marvet Simone. When we say we, somebody want to, wants to slake their thirst, we say Marvet Simone, the same root, the same word. Meaning, Revaya is when you drink wine, my cup of wine is overflowing, which is my cup of blessing. So on Purim, the whole entire miracle of Purim is very connected to wine, beginning from the Feast of Achashverosh, the Feast of Esther, and the Mitzvah of Purim. Or Purim, it's a Mitzvah to drink so much wine until you don't know the difference between our uh, curse is Haman and blessed is Mordechai. So when it says, and you took us out, you redeemed us to be satiated or overflowing, it's going on a cup of wine. Next introduction. Rabbi Yechanan. Pasach la pischa la parsha samehacha. When Rabbi Yechanan introduced the Megillah, he introduced it with an introduction based on the following pasach, on the following verse, giving another perspective to the Megillah. How it's a holy thing and why we need the beginning of the Megillah. It says over here in Tehillim, let me just bring it up on the screen. Here it is. We say this every Friday night. Shiru Hashem Yichir Yishir Chadash. Sing to Hashem a new song. Ki Neflois Asa, he has performed wonders. Hashem has stretched out his right hand and holy arm, and we were saved by Hashem. Haydi Hashem Yeshuasa, Le'ena Gaim Gil Tzikasa. Hashem has made known his salvation in the eyes of the nations, revealed his righteousness. Here's a, a famous niggin, Zacher Chasle Vemunasa Lebeis Yisrael. Hashem has made his kindness and his faith um, to the, of the Jewish nation. From all the ends of the earth, they have seen how Hashem has saved us, has given us, the Jewish nation, a salvation. If you look at the introduction, it says, Mizmurzeh al Asid Lavai. This chapter is a praise is to Hashem, which will be in the future when Mashiach comes. All the nations of the world will, will praise Hashem that Hashem has saved the Jewish people. And it just continues this, discussing all the joy and the singing, which will come from all the nations of the world, thanking Hashem for saving the Jews. And he explained this Pasuk to be going on the Megillah. What does it mean? Zacher chasev v'menosei l'beis Yisrael. He's remembered his mercy and his faithfulness towards the house of Israel. Ra'u chalafsi ares es Yeshua salakeinu. All the nations who are at the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of Hashem. A Masai. When did the ends of the a Masai row al Afsi Ares as Yeshua Salakinu? At what point did all the nations from the ends of the earth 
see the salvation of Hashem. When did that, when did that take place? In the times of Mordechai and Esther. In the times of Mordechai and Esther, uh, Ahasuerus ruled over 127 provinces, which was the entire um, settled uh, civilization, known civilization at that time. And they sent letters to every single nation, to all 127 countries, telling them, uh, telling them about the miracle of Purim. So all, so when did it happen that everyone in the world will know what Hashem did? That specifically was in the time of Purim. Other salvations, not necessarily did they reach the entire civilized world. But Purim, this is the first time that everywhere in the world found out about it. Nowadays, Baruch Hashem, Hashem has shown us how it's so easy to put information all over the world very quickly at any given time. For the good, for the not good, and the entire nation, entire ends of the earth, of course, will know about the salvation of Hashem. Marsha over here explains this entire verse, Zachar Chasid Vemunasai, is going on Purim. Not just the words, that all the ends of the earth. All the people and all the ends of the earth knew about Hashem's salvation, but even the entire verse of Zachar Chasdei Vemunasai, he has remembered the mercy and the faith. That's also going on Purim, because Chasdei, his kindness, Vemunasai, and his faith is going on the Jews during the time of Achashverosh, where they were deserving of destruction. As we'll learn soon in the Gemara, in Dafyu Gimel, that because they, the Jews, uh, had pleasure from the meal of Achashverosh, they were deserving of destruction. Not that they should be destroyed, but just that they uh, were deserving of, of Hashem's protection being removed. And then automatically the nations of the world would want to destroy them. And Hashem saved the Jews in the merit of the of tzaddikim, the, of the righteous people, which did not sin. So that is called chastoy, his kindness. His kindness is that Hashem used his chesed, his kindness, to give, uh, to save the Jewish people, even if they were undeserving of it. And then Amunasa, his faith, is going on the tzaddikim, on the holy, on, on the righteous people. In the merit of the righteous people, Hashem saved all the Jews. You see something very unique. The Jews in the times of Mordechai, many Jews were upset with Mordechai. Mordechai, because of you, you refused to bow down to Haman. You're causing anti-Semitism. You caused that Haman should get a, make a decree against the Jews to annihilate them. All your fault, you fanatic Mordechai. And we see you was the exact opposite over here. Emunasai. Because of the tzaddikim, because of Mordechai, that's why the Jews were saved. So when the tzaddikim are saved, that is called emunasai, his righteousness. When it says, leves Yisrael, for the house of Israel, the house of Israel, who is called the bias, the house, the Jewish woman are called basi, my house is, my, uh, is usually the Jewish woman, she is a mainstay of the house, the most important um, function, most important institution in Yiddishkeit is a Jewish house, a Jewish home. The, the, the woman determine if somebody is born Jewish or not. So Beis Yisrael, the house of Israel, uh, is going on the, the woman. When it says, Koyser Mar, the Beis Yaakov, so you shall tell to the house of Yaakov, it's going on the Jewish woman. And so the miracle of when it says Hashem remembered the uh, kindness and faith, faith for the house of Israel. So the Marsha explains the Beis Yisrael is going on. The house of Israel is going on Queen Esther because Queen Esther, Esther Amalka, she was a tzaddikus, a righteous woman. And the miracle happened through Esther. At the end of the verse, which says, Ro'uchalaf se'ares es Yeshuas elekeinu. All of the nations at the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of Hashem. 
is that Hashem saved us in every single part of the world. At no time in history, besides for Mitzrayim, and at the time of Purim, was there a decree of destruction in every single Jew in the world, and there was no one, nowhere to escape to. In every other persecution of the Jewish people, the destruction of the first base of Mikdash, uh, the destruction of the second base of Mikdash, the Crusades, the Cossacks, the Holocaust, the Inquisition, every single persecution that the Jewish people have went through, there was somewhere the Jews could have escaped. Uh, could have escaped. They were safe. They were safe shores somewhere in the world. The only time he did not have that was obviously by Lavan, when Yaakov was in the house of Lavan in Egypt, and during the time of Purim, where there was nowhere to escape to. Every single Jew in the world was under the rule of Achashverosh. So the ends of the earth is that every single from the ends of the earth, every single Jew was saved. That there was the Jews in every single one of the 127 uh, provinces of Achashverosh were saved from Hashem. Fine. So we're holding by Reish Lakish. Now, I guess we'll continue with Reish Lakish on Monday in Mirza Hashem. Um, we'll continue now with the Mimer. So I think yesterday was i don't know how uh how well it went over so maybe we'll go back a few lines we'll redo it we'll do it a little bit quicker when Hashem created the world, Hashem made a system. Hashem believes Hashem created a system for, uh, as we're learning in Kuntur Sumayan, it's all for the sake of the Jewish people, and Jewish people thrive on systems. When we're given to our own devices, not always does it come out to be the best. When we follow the framework of Hashem, it comes out to be the best. It comes out and we accomplish much, much more than we could have ever have imagined. But as the creation of the world goes down, the further down in the worlds, in the levels of worlds of, of creation, there's less visible light. The light is still there. It's just not visible. Eventually, uh, we hit, we, we leave the spiritual sphere and we start coming to physicality. Even physical, you know, is, is immense. Try um, measuring just what we know of the universe, and what Hashem created of the universe. So you can imagine, you know, and, and we don't even know a, a small, tiny fraction of it. As the, as the, so the most spiritual part of physical is, meaning the most non-physical objects are the spirit of uh, the heavenly um, bodies, heavenly spheres. It's called the orbits and the mazalas. We said the word mazalas comes from the word noislim, which means a flow of chayas, a flow of life, a flow of vitality from the worlds. V'lachen, and therefore... Everything in this world comes through a system, a system of, of, uh, of the heavenly bodies, which are in orbit. So the sun, the moon, the stars, everything is connected to giving um, chayas, to, to the world in their own way. Um, there's, for example, I think in the Halacha, the, the planet of Jupiter is called Kochav Agadol. It's called a large star. That's what, that is, that's what it's called. And we know nowadays it has a very important function in giving life to the world. Right? The, it's, a, it's the largest planet. It's so big that it could, all the other planets could fit inside with room to spare. And its function is that the gravity is so large that it pulls 
all the different uh, rocks and meteorites and asteroids into itself, that it shouldn't come to the world, to this world. So every single thing in the world has a function to give life to this world. And the mazalas, the constellations also, and mazalas comes from the term noislim, flow, a mazal, when you say mazal toif, congratulations to somebody. What it does mean is mazal toif, you have a good flow of energy, meaning Hashem gave you a lot of spiritual chayas, blessings. Everything comes through the mazalas. As it says in Parshas, that Hashem um, gives blessings to the world, and so, there are some uh, types of vegetables and plants and, and fruits that grow from the sunlight, and some grow from the moonlight. It's called nightshades. Right? Some grow from the sun, some grow from the moon. Meaning, in a spiritual sense, Hashem gives every single uh, being in the world, every physical object, it's what it needs, its life, from, through the mazalas, through the medium of the constellations. This was the beginning of idol worship, when people thought that we should start serving these constellations. We should thank them, thank the messenger. It's like... Uh, you know, if, if, if a taxi driver drives you somewhere, think the taxi. Instead of thinking the driver. And a muzzle uh, is not just a muzzle. A the flow of energy isn't just in the worlds, but there's many thousands of them. Every single blade of grass in the world Every single thing that grows has a mazel, which is like an angel, which is its flow of life, which strikes it and tells it to grow. Every single thing that grows, except for four things, which are the Dalad Minim, the Lul of Esri, Hadassim, and Aravas, it says they don't have an angel who hits it and tells it to grow. Rather, Hashem himself directly takes, uh, makes the Lul of Esri, Hadassim, and Aravas. Because since they are objects of a mitzvah, and what's accomplished through them is very great, Hashem himself takes care of them. Does not let it flow through a malach, through a mazel, through an angel, rather Hashem directly. What is this mazel? What is this angel who hits the a plant and tells it to grow? Shuba me'or v'chayis aliki sheshefeya derech halgalgalim v'hamazalis. This is the godly light and energy flowing through the intermediaries of the different mazalas, of the different orbits and mazals. So everything in this world comes through the mediums of what Hashem makes it. Now for Hashem, can you imagine an infinite, the only Hashem, and for people to receive sustenance that comes from, through these mazalas, it's a very big concealment. It's a big descent for the godly light. Many multiple levels of concealment. For the many different worlds of creation, the world of Bria, the world of Yitzira, the world of Asiya. Eventually, after it comes through the intermediary, which goes from spiritual to physical, eventually it will come and will descend into physical things in this world. And for Hashem to be involved in such things is almost a, an embarrassment. Imagine the, you know, the president of the U.S. and in, and uh, he, you know, in order to set up his event, he's the one setting up the table, putting, taking everything off, and sweeping the floor for all the guests that come. That's an embarrassment. You can imagine what it is to Hashem. 
ubefrat, but it's not just physical things. It goes even lower. The infinite light of Hashem, the Aren Saif, goes down even lower. We're in the middle of the theme of Aren Saif, Lamata Adin Tachlis. The infinite light of Hashem goes downwards to no end. Eventually, the light of Hashem is concealed and contracted and minimized and, co- and covered over more and more until we have klipa. Actually, it is possible to have something completely the opposite, utter opposite of godliness. It is, it is possible to forget about Hashem. And we're going to go soon, and later on in the Mimer, in, the, in one of the variants of forgetting about Hashem could be in, in, in an even lower way than forgetting about Hashem, is knowing about Hashem and actively knowing and actively, actively ignoring Him. Eventually you come into the levels of klipa, levels of impurity, and how much more so is the Shekhinah, Hashem's divine presence, is in a gullus, in exile, and an embarrassment when it comes to Klippa. Eventually you have Paroi, which says, I made the river, uh, I made the um, Nile, um, the actual pus of the verse, as I heard from Chaim Shalom Daich, is Liya Oidi Vani Asisi, the river is mine and I have made it. The Nile River, which in Egypt, um, all the sustenance called the, the Nile Delta, all the farming, everything comes from the Nile River. And Pari said, the river is mine and I have made it. But uh, over here in the Mimer, it changes it to Avani Asisini. It means, and I have made it and I have made myself. Ani Asisi is I have made the river. Mania Sisini is I have made myself and I have made the river. So Paro's Paro is boasting things that he knows are patently false. That I have made the river. And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu had to go um, early in the morning when Paro is by the river to, um, and he would relieve himself in the river, showing how you are just human and mortal, mortal like everyone else. This is completely the opposite of the truth. So the Shekhinah goes down, and the Shekhinah is contracted, the Shekhinah is hidden, not just a physical which is thing which is extremely low, but even more than that, it brings into being things which are not aware of the existence of Hashem, or things which are aware of Hashem and deny Him. So in Klippa itself, you have many different levels of Klippa. But to have a klipa which knows Hashem and wants to rebel against Hashem, that is a very low klipa. Someone which doesn't know anything, you could change them, you could educate them. Someone who has an agenda to go against, that's very hard, you can't do. In the times of the Rebbe Rashab, we have a yom yom. Um, the Rebbe Rashab said that we should not go you should stay away from a, an offensive battle as much as possible. The battle for Yiddishkeit, he says, our job is to um, strengthen the fortress of Yiddishkeit, strengthen the yeshiva, strengthen the learning of Torah of every individual, strengthening the shiurim, strengthening your mitzvahs that you do. But stay away from Mechemetz Tanufa, trying to an offensive battle, trying to get other people. The Rebbe in Tavshin Yudzayin, and the Rebbe brought this in Hayom Yom. However, in Tavshin Yudzayin, 1957, 1956 actually, it was during Simcha Space Hashueva, and the Rebbe says that times have changed now. And now you have to go specifically on Mechemetz Tanufa in an offensive battle when it comes to Yiddishkeit. Because in the times of the Rebbe Rishab, when he said that those who were not, those who were opposite, those opposing Yiddishkeit were people who grew up in Yeshiva, people who learned in Cheder, and they were fighting tooth and nail against Yiddishkeit, and there was nothing you could do to get them to come close. You had to strengthen your own fortresses. But nowadays, those who are fighting against Yiddishkeit is not that they have an agenda against it, it's that they just don't know better. And therefore, you should have an offensive battle, and you must go on an offensive battle. 
and there's many advantages of it. One of them is when you're busy fighting others, meaning fighting others, fighting the um, the opponents by trying to bring them close to Yiddishkeit, your own Yiddishkeit will not suffer. If you have a defensive battle, all you're doing is protecting your borders. So you have attack and attack and attack. The best case scenario is you'll repel all the attacks. However, if you're going out and trying to find others and bring them close to Yiddishkeit, so then there's no chance of anybody coming to attack your fortress. And even more than that, you eventually could be successful and find other Jews and bring them close to Yiddishkeit as well. And the biggest thing is to find other people from the other side and bring them onto your team so that they too should become going to the Machemah an offensive battle. So we see that a, a, a level lower than those who don't know is those who know and go against. So Paro is, is a prime example of someone who knew about the greatness of Hashem. And still, he denied Hashem and saying, I made the river and I made myself. And to the extent is that MSU by Varech Yaakov as Paro. The real truth is, during the years of famine, Yaakov Avinu came down to Mitzrayim to Egypt and he gave a bracha, a blessing to Paroi. And he told Paroi that when you come to the Nile River, the river will come up to greet you. The water will rise whenever you come to the Nile River. So he took this blessing that he got from Yaakov and he used it to deny Hashem. So what bigger... Um, what bigger uh, denying and what bigger chutzpah could there be is taking a blessing that you receive from Hashem and using it to fight against Hashem. You know, the Friedrich Rebbe, Friedrich Rebbe writes in his diary about the year 1923, it was, maybe 20, maybe 21. This is in Rostov. Um, this is, I think it was 1921, actually, the first year of the Friedrich Rebbe's Messias. And, you know, a bunch of, then it was called the Cheka, the NKVD, KGB, they constantly changed their names. And then you had the Yifsekzia, the Jewish division of the of the, of the uh, Communist Party, which were the most uh, fanatic, anti-from, anti-religious um, part of the Jewish party that could possibly be. And he describes how they burst, you know, he burst in on him with a, um, yeah, it was 1920 or 21. It was within the year of the Estakos of the Rebbe Rashab. And they um, told the Fidik, they burst in, they told the Fidik Rebbe, you're under arrest. And one of them held a gun to the Fidik Rebbe. And he told him in Yiddish, this little toy has made many people change their minds. And the Friedrich Rebbe answered him, it only has an effect on someone who has um, two gods and one world. But if you have one world, if you have one god and two worlds, then this toy does not have an effect on them. The Friedrich Rebbe describes who are these people. One of them, his father was a chassid and he knew them growing up. And the other one was a Jew who lived in Rostov, who came in very hard times. And he says, a very like, not too long before that, um, when this Jew um, came, you know, and uh, had very hard uh, financial times, he came to the Friedrich Rebbe and he asked him for a loan, for help for, for you know, for, for himself and for, 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 his, for his, to live and for his, you know, for his business. And the Friedrich Rebbe gave him a loan. He never asked for it back and he never paid it back. And this was a Jew who was holding the gun against the Friedrich Rebbe. Describing how someone could be not just ungrateful, but could be, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. Yaakov gave a bracha to Paroi that the Nile shall come to greet him. And, and, and Paroi used that to say, how oh, look, I'm so divine that the Nile is coming to greet me. This was the manifestation of goodness coming from Yaakov through Yaakov's bracha. Yaakov gave a blessing, made a extra godliness and extra blessings should come. And instead, Para used it for the opposite. And he says here in the footnote, you could read it, um, how it was, which, which level Yaakov Avinu 
um, blessed him from, from the level of Tainuk, that the Tainuk should come down to Parai. However, in a spiritual sense, why was Parai ungrateful? And why did he start rebelling against Hashem? Because Parai is the king of Egypt. Egypt means mitzarim, limits, vulim, constrictions. So Parai is Parai Malach Mitzrayim. He is a king of limits, a king of everything um, constricting. So therefore, bringing good to Parai will only bring good to what he's good at, is hovering over limiting godliness. And Parai, in addition to that, he is ungrateful and he rebels against Hashem. And he says, I have created myself, I have created the river which is the exact opposite of the truth of Yaakov. Now, this is not only learning about Parai, this applies to every single one of us. It's not so far from us, and it could be very um, practical for many of us how such a thing is. Every single Jew has the same thing in their own life. Whether one is a businessman, whether one is a Torah scholar, we could apply the same shortcomings that Parai has applied to us as well. And we can learn from this how to increase and to be better in our mission of making this world a dwelling place for Hashem how does this apply to everyone? What, how can we apply this to ourselves? Here is going to speak very practically. A businessman could think to himself, The businessman thinks to himself, I was successful. I made a good deal. All right, today was a good day. Came as a result of all my efforts over all the over all these years over over today, I did it. A person knows, and a person could talk about it, and a person could understand. Yes, Hashem is in charge. Hashem is the one who gives me power. Hashem gives me the ability to be successful. And like Shlomo HaMelech says, it's a blessing of Hashem, which makes one wealthy. Even more than that, a person can mention Hashem's name all the time. I'm mentioning Hashem whenever I'm doing business. With God's help. And a person could really know it, believe it, and mention it all the time which applies to, to many, many of us, and even so, a person still takes credit and he thinks it's his own power, its own strength. I knew the Listen, I was a good chap I did, you know, I, I, I figured something out good. My own intellectual prowess, that's responsible for my success in, in everything that I've done. Therefore, when, th- when things are going good and things are going successful, and everything you're doing, is quoting from Tehillim, Perakin and Beis, a person could uh, become bold in his wickedness. A person successful in business, I'm so rich, I'm wealthy. I don't have to go to a minion now. I don't have to go, uh, you know, people having a fabrengia now for encourage. There's no need for me to do it. Or I'll show up for 15 minutes, see how they can entertain me. When a person is successful, they're very prone to becoming bold in the wickedness, I mean, bold in, in, in the belief in their own powers, their own prowess. <laughs> They're proud in their own being. They have advice for everyone. 
and it seems to them that it's my own wisdom which has made me successful. They become very inflated with themselves. You know, there was a person who was once very wealthy, and everyone came over to him asking him his advice, trying to become his friend. And then unfortunately, he lost everything. And he says, I don't get it. I lost my money. It's one thing. But where did my seichel go? Where did my uh, you know wisdom? I lost that too. No one's coming over to me asking me anything else. My advice. So a person could think, if a person becomes happy from their success, they're happy because it's my success. Even though he knows it's Hashem, that's the same thing as Pare, knowing it's from Hashem and still taking credit from it. And the opposite is true as well. When it's times of difficulty, God forbid, no one should go through this. People become depressed, they lose their heart, they become discouraged. Both of them are not true. No reason to be overly happy by the success or be overly upset by the failure. The Shneya Menememes, both of these reactions are not justified. The Meyacher de Birchas Avaya Hitasher, what it is Hashem's blessing which grants wealth. Haritzarch Lias, the Hashva, Beharish Nafshe, a person should always feel the equal, equal, the same in the face of both situations. Whether he's successful, he should feel happy, and the unsuccessful, he should feel happy because it's Hashem who makes wealth. If something is not successful, there's a fault in himself. A person should look in his actions, see how he could um, fix uh, what, what there is to fix, recognize that it's Hashem who does it. So this is how in every single person by in, in their own life, even though we know it's Hashem who brings us prosperity, but this is a knowledge, sometimes it's a chach manabina without a das, without an application. And we could sort of put in the back burner, then what we know is that it's Hashem who gives us, gives us success and Hashem who makes it unsuccessful. And what we have to do is just improve ourselves. And in addition to that, it could be by a Torah scholar, someone whose job is to sit and learn, or you know, a person during the time they're learning, they are a Yeshiv Ayel. They are a, tar- a person is considered to be a Torah scholar at the time that they're learning Torah. But a person could learn Torah all day. And if he's successful in something, you could think, wow, I was successful. This is me. Because it's a lot of effort. And a person could think it's their effort which has made them successful. A similar situation may occur among those who sit and learn Torah in the tents. By Yaakov, it says he was a... Yoshev Oyalim, he sat and he in the tents and he learned Torah of, of Shem and Ever. A person can learn Torah knowing that it's a Torah of Hashem. And nevertheless, it is possible with the power of Torah, he can. We can make a a, a psak din, a, a halachic ruling, which is the opposite of Torah. And um, time constraints, but there, there's many, many examples of such things uh, where people with the power of Torah, and they made a, a, a ruling which is the exact opposite of the Torah and the spirit of the Torah. In this regard, it can resemble a businessman. Which, although the Torah scholar, just like a businessman, could believe in Hashem with a simple faith, that Hashem is the one who gives him power to be successful, and the blessing of Hashem is who grants wealth. Nevertheless, when someone is successful, He's proud of himself and his affairs are very successful. 
and when God forbid, it's not good for him. A person could become very dejected and crestfallen and stressed when things are not good for him. The reason why the person feels stressed is because he's not approaching his entire business in the correct way. This that a person believes that Hashem is the one who gives me power to be successful, and it's all Hashem. By a person, it's only in a, a level of simple faith. But he did not apply it, he did not bring it down to, to, to live with it on a moment-to-moment basis, in a conscious way. The whole foundation of his of business and his commerce are not going according to the Torah. If you ask him, do you believe in Hashem? Of course. You mentioned that everything is from Hashem. However, he still get, he gets stressed out when it's a tough situation. Not something easy to, to, to always um, accomplish. When a person works on it, they realize that. Uh, I mean, I think since it's end of the week, or maybe Monday we'll begin with the new Mimer. So we'll finish. Uh, we're almost done um, over here. So we'll finish the rest of this sif, the rest of this uh, paragraph, this chapter, about another uh, six, seven, no, about another nine, ten lines. Um, just I wanted to mention that Amir Tashem, tomorrow will be a shir at 10.30 by Rabbi uh, Darren. And on Shabbos morning, uh, so Minik Chassidim, Kassim Chassidim, everyone should get an aliyah on Shabbos before Yud Shvat. And therefore, um, everyone is going to be from 8.30 in the morning, Minyanim and Shul, for everyone to get an aliyah. And Rabbi Darren, also starting at 8.30, will be giving a class a shir. In, in the Basi Lagani of the year 1983. So you could come early, get an aliyah, come to the shir, um, have a coffee in Mazenas as well on Shabbos morning. So now we're going to just uh, finish up in, in the last uh, 10 lines. In a similar fashion, a Torah scholar, if you can learn Torah, knowing that's the Torah of Hashem, the manner which he learns and studies Torah is improper. It's very possible when he's learning Torah, he forgets the giver of the Torah. Hashem, the one who gave the Torah. Um, you know, unfortunately, many examples of this throughout history, you know, um, Certain people who were top students in their yeshivas and Sabatka, Slutsk, etc. And on Shabbos, you know, they were uh, caught smoking a cigarette from the greatest Hamid de Chachamim, learning the Torah. To forget it's possible to know and, and not apply it. It is a mere intellectual exercise. And since it is merely an intellectual exercise, if afterwards you know what you have learned, even though he knows that it's Hashem's Torah, it's merely an intellectual uh, exercise by them. A person might not appreciate the godliness in a cow, a horse, and an ox. Or even if you're learning a spiritual part of Torah, and possible, even when one's learning Hasidus, and you could focus on it and look at it as an intellectual exercise. That leads, that's the same thing as Parai was doing. Knowing Hashem and rebelling against Him simultaneously. And it's possible, God forbid, through following the dictates of your independent logic, to say that something which is totally opposite of the Torah, in the, with the power of the Torah. 
So this applies whether one is a businessman, whether one is a Torah scholar. Both of these are true. A person should realize that he is only doing, they're doing what Hashem gives him the power to do. And it's only Hashem's blessings which are manifesting. Therefore, no reason to be stressed out or upset at any one at any given time. The high noon. The Klalas Inyan, and to tie back to what we were saying before about Orin Soif Lamata, Adin Tachlis, about how Shem's infinite light comes to infinite levels downwards, and the same infinite light is actually there in the lowest of the low. The Klalas Inyan, Hagam Shem Akab Achayis Melikus Mamish, in broad terms, we can appreciate the pattern at work. Although a person receives their life from Hashem, and and they know that, and we realize that it comes from Hashem. God forbid, it could be the opposite of godliness. Arba, and he could live your life in a way which is not um, compatible with Hashem. Because Hashem's divine light is concealed in myriads and, and multiple filters. This is in the week of Beshalach, which is always a week, which is very, very commonly the week of Yitzhak. Um, In Parshas Beshalach, it says, Tubu v'yamsuf. The Egyptians drowned in the sea. The word Tubu, drowning, is from the term Teva, which means nation, uh, nature. In nature, Hashem, godliness, His light is drowned. Sha'aru mutba, in nature, Hashem is concealed. Hashem's godliness, which sustains it, is sunken into concealment in a hidden way. The light is run down through many levels of the uh, progression of the worlds. Until the very lowest levels of Hashem. So when it says Aren Saif Lamata, Adin Tachlis is that Hashem's light goes downwards to no end. Hashem's infinite light is in every single being all the way. And therefore, even a businessman who's successful or unsuccessful, a Torah scholar who's successful in his learning or unsuccessful, know that should know and that the Aren Saif, that the infinite light of Hashem is here, Lamat Adin Tachlis. The same Elikus, godliness, which is the beginning of creation, which is above creation. That is right here in our success and in our failures and with us in every single aspect of our of our life. And later on, he explains about um, Hashem, although the, the, the light is, con is concealed, this concealed light gives life to everybody. And this, in turn, a person's avoida, a person's service of Hashem, with skafia sapcha, uh, subduing themselves and working on themselves reveals the orange self, the infinite light of Hashem that's already there, which is a purpose of the entire creation. Um, so, Yeshakoyach, Yeshakoyach for 